Hello, everybody, and welcome to the latest episode of Vox Vomitus. I am your host, author Jennifer Ann Gordon, the author of the award-winning novels Beautiful, Frightening, and Silent, as well as Pretty Ugly and the Hotel series. Joining me today, as always, is my Vox Vomitus vixen, Alison Martine, author of the Bourbon books, which includes the award-winning novel Nibs, Dibs, Nibs. <laughs> Screw it up the beginning. Cheese crackers. Dibs. I know. Now I'm thinking about I'd eat those too. <laughs> Dibs since September and move on, Melinda. With us today is Peter Kleins, New York Times bestselling author and author of his brand new book, which came out yesterday, The Broken Room. Ah. For those of you who are only listening, we all held up the book <laughs> at the same time, so it was book magic. <laughs> Welcome, Peter, to Vox Vomitus. <laughs> Hi, thanks for Hi. having me. <laughs> thanks for being here. So we were getting to know you a little bit before we went live. Uh, I would love it if you could tell our viewers and listeners a little bit about yourself and then a little bit about The Broken Room. Uh, okay. No pressure. Well, yeah. Little tell the thing about, about the zoo. <laughs> I was oh. going to say, we can do it for you about how you uh, left a food um, court to come to California and may or may not have been a 49er, but I think that may have been an ancestor. That was something else. That was an ancestor. Okay. Um, yeah, I uh, basically grew up back in New England and it, it, we were talking beforehand about how when you're a little kid, everything seems normal. Um, so I grew up in a little town in Maine on the beach that was a resort town. So like, you know, half the town empties out in the winter. Um, and it was a, I just thought it was normal that you grow up in a town with tons of empty buildings and an old half abandoned amusement park and, you know, weird little movie theater. And because we had this zoo right here, uh, basically there's like the zoo about, man, I guess maybe three quarters of a mile, maybe half a mile of woods. And then my back, my actual backyard, the backyard of my the house I grew up in. And did you ever like, sneak into the abandoned zoo? Oh, all the time. Yeah, Good. when we were a kid. Again, we all just thought it was normal. And then every now and then, like during the summer when the animals were there, like the parents had like this phone tree because you'd suddenly hear the oh, mountain lion got out. Everyone get your kids in. You know? And <gasps> that was gonna be my next question. <laughs> and, yeah, you know, and we'd be like playing out back and mom would yell, Come in! Something got out of the zoo. Mountain lion on the loose. <laughs> Um, I grew up in New Hampshire, which is also in New England, and we lived not too far, which is in New England, for people who don't know, um, we lived close to a place called Benson's Animal Farm, and Benson's, they would allow the baby animals, not the aggressive ones, to just kind of roam free during the summer, and I remember yearly, I was chased by a baby ostrich <laughs> multiple, multiple yeah. times. Maybe they need to redefine what aggressive means. I know. <laughs> like, that ostrich is a jerk. <laughs> so now I have like a weird fear of ostriches. <laughs> I don't think that's that weird. So, but Pete, now you're currently in San Diego. So is it a requirement for you that you live near a zoo? Do we lose Peter? He's frozen. He's frozen. And he looks really confused in our, in our. See, I think he looks like he's really confused. I am probably having the issues. Oh, there you are. Are you back? We can hear you. He's in the broken room. He is in the broken We already broke Peter in the broken room. He's Ouch. Back. Okay. There you are. You were in the broken I'm sorry. room. <laughs> I do not know what just happened right there. I'm sorry. That's okay. Well, we got you back. I was just asking okay. if it's a requirement that you always live near a zoo. Um, I'd never thought about it. But no, because I, when I lived in LA for a while, I was nowhere near a zoo. They have so, a zoo. I was going to say, I feel like depending on where in LA you are, zoo is all relative. Yes. Well, and I also wanted least, to know, do you sneak into the San Diego Zoo at night? And I won't tell if you do. I can't say. But I used to have a job <laughs> where we did get to hang out at the zoo at night a lot. So. <gasps> what is that job? What was that job? Zoo uh, security? I, no. I used to do uh, lighting events. Okay. It was one of the many odd jobs I had at different times. So we would the company I was with, uh, we would go in and we'd be the ones who'd like set up the little dance plazas yeah. and stuff like huh. that. Yeah. It's like event planning in a hotel. Yeah. Yeah. And they, they've got like steel drum bands and all sorts of stuff. And they, they right. actually do during summer have zoo after dark and things like that. Exactly. So. That was, the, we did that stuff. <laughs> yeah. The company, the company that I worked for set up a lot of the lights for that sort of stuff that nice. we would go in, they'd have us there when nobody was. So we'd be there in the middle of the night you know, setting up lights and hearing the lions get fed or something like that. 
So, <sighs> so Pete, I've, I've read your books for, for a couple of years now. And it's kind of funny because you. your book was the very first audiobook that I ever bought myself. You have, you, you have the honor of being the one who I'm like, you were an audiobook this. virgin until Peter okay, Klein. Technically only sort of, because here's the deal. My husband and I share an account and I used to say, audiobooks aren't like actually reading books. That's cheating. And I was so elitist about it, which is so funny because I'm constantly <laughs> listening to them now, but he got one and he's like, oh, I have this and it's narrated by Will Wheaton. Do you want to listen to it? And it's really unfair to use your wife's childhood crush against her like that. So of course, yeah, I, I listened to it. But then I'm like, well, okay, this is this is cool. What else can I get? And just randomly going through, I'd never heard of you. I found the fold. I loved it. He listened to it too. So that's that's been my experience with it. But here, here we go. Going through this now, you're like, okay, The Broken Room this lovely book okay. here. I'm a, oh, 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 this, on. Yeah. <laughs> Hold on, let's do I it again. This, okay. this oh. lovely book has has some tenuous connection to the fold. Is that is that correct that it's in kind of the same universe? Do you have your own cinematic universe um, now, Peter? I wouldn't say cinematic universe, but I've I've played around with sort of the more the multiverse idea. Yeah. That I, I that, that, that I, I let well, I think all of us like like the the idea of like, oh, what if this person turned out somewhat different yeah um yes. so one thing like if you read this book the character hector um who hector, is my new book boyfriend by the way <laughs> <laughs> um hector is actually in the ex-heroes books that i wrote um and there's a whole bit in this book not really giving anything away when he talks about when he was a kid and his his grandfather took him down because it's like i'm either going to join a gang or you're going to enlist. One of your choices. Drag him down. In the Exeros book, Hector is a gang. Hector is a gangster, and he had been <sighs> in one of the LA gangs when oh. the zombie apocalypse happened. Okay, I so, love that. I love that too. Because I, I because I've had people who were asking who saw that you were coming on the show, and they're like, "Oh, is it connected to this?" And I'm like, "I'm not sure. There's some tenuous connections here, but I'm not sure it's the same one." And then I'd heard, "Oh no, Hector's a new character, so he is, but he isn't." Right, I and I and that. I hate and, and I hate. No offense. I hate getting those sort of questions. Not like for me, but even in general, when people like, you know, when I announce a new book coming out, everyone's like, is it tied to the threshold books? Yeah, people want to know. This? Yeah. They want to know. But at the same time, it puts you in this awkward spot because obviously for a lot of these sort of things, finding it out is part of the fun. Yes. Yes. That, is Easter it, eggs. Is it, is it, right. Um, the, the example I gave people is like, okay, if you're a Marvel movie fan mm -hmm. and you say, okay, is Ant-Man and the Wasp connected to the Avengers? And it's like, well, yeah, no, Ish. but yes. <laughs> but if I say yes, I'm kind of giving something away. Right. You don't want to give away the whole plot. I think what most people are asking is if they come to this one without having that read the other ones, are they going to be confused? Are they going to be missing backstory? Because I know a lot of people like me, I'm the kind when I start reading something and I find out oh, I'm, I'm misunderstanding stuff. I'm not getting the depth. I want to read things in order. I know other people are like, I like reading things completely out of order. So that's kind of like you're trying to balance what reader preferences are because they they want to have right. they want to have all the pieces of info before they go into the broken room. And, and that's why I, I try very few of my books. The X Heroes books are more or less a series. Obviously, as you get deeper into the X Heroes books, mm -hmm. it greatly helps to have read the earlier X Heroes yeah. books. Pretty much everything else I've written, there are like connections between things, but like I know a ton of people who read The Fold and had not read my earlier book, 14, that The Fold connects to. <laughs> right. Yeah. But everyone enjoyed The Fold. Yeah, you didn't um, need it. Right. And that's how I prefer to tell stories. They're like, like loosely. Loosely related. Right. I, yeah. I think if, if I've got a book, if I haven't planned it that way, it feels kind of cheaty to say this book would be, you're not going to understand this book if you didn't read that book and that book and that book. Yeah. Well, I, I think it's kind of a compliment because I know Allison and I were talking, Hector is such an incredible character and he's so fully formed right from the get-go that even I was scared. I was like, wait, is this like the second book in a series? <laughs> should I know him already? <laughs> should I already know him? Exactly. So I, I went to Google and then I'm like, nope, it's fine. <laughs> but I mean, when it's I, a testament to your writing that he yeah. came out like fully formed. Thank when I When I wrote this... Uh, the whole book kind of came out of nowhere and I wrote the first three chapters like over a weekend, just sit down and like, bam, bam, bam. And the three, the first three chapters in the book are almost exactly as I wrote them that weekend. 
There, nice. There's been very, nice. very minimal. Energy. And because of that, that I wrote it in a weekend, I was then convinced they were garbage and that I had screwed up something. <laughs> and so my partner's a writer and I showed it to her and I, I showed it to like a couple other friends. Were you doing that writer book. thing where you're like, is this a thing? Is this even Yes, anything? exactly. What is this? Like is showing this it to people. Is it, so is this garbage? Did I write garbage? And <laughs> Did I write garbage and, or did I write something that's going to win an award? Because it's like a yeah. fine line. Like I'm a and genius of, or I'm an idiot. And, and one of my friends was like, this is a first draft, you bastard. Yeah, they hate <laughs> you instantly. <laughs> yeah. no, and, I, and I get that because I know that certain, sometimes my process is like pulling teeth. And then when it isn't, when it's like whipped cream instead of churning butter, yeah. you're like, this can't be right because yeah. it shouldn't have been this easy. And then, of course, yes. you have to doubt it because you're going, no, no, this is not the process. What happened here? There, there's a bit in the fold that, honest to God, up until the very end, I almost pulled it out because I was like, uh, in the very beginning of the book, you might remember, at one point, they're explaining how the doorway works. Right. And they're folding a sheet of paper mm -hmm. to demonstrate how you can move points closer together, right. even though the the plane that they're in has not changed. Mm -hmm. And... I wrote that out and then I was like, this is great. This is such a cool example. I must have stolen this from something. Crap. Did. Like, where did yeah. I? <laughs> yeah. yeah. It's called Wrinkle in Time, but that's okay. <laughs> I thought it was Wrinkle Time like is a string. That was like it. Mr. It's, a string. It's, it's I mean, it's one of those things where it's it's reminiscent of that. So that's probably yeah. why you're like, this I know of <laughs> Yes. And that was it. So I was like fretting and fretting and whatever, everything I read. And and my partner said the same thing. She's like, it's kind of like how they explained it in Wrinkle of Time, but not really. Yeah. And I'm like, okay, well, I guess I made this up. Then. <laughs> you <laughs> made it up enough. It. It's not like, yeah. did I steal this from Stephen King or somebody? Like, yeah. people, everyone's going to be like, uh, that was in blah, blah, blah. <laughs> yeah. Well, that's oh, the, the worst part when you, I have the idea for this really cool scene. And so, you know, that was Creep Show, right? That was the whole thing. <laughs> That whole no, <laughs> mine was different. The guy's in a blue sweatshirt. <laughs> when I was very little, I was convinced I had made up the phrase the boogeyman for like oh, that was years. <laughs> for years I thought I made it up. And I like saw it on TV and I'm like, it's so weird that like I made up this phrase and now there's somebody else it. did too. <laughs> like on a Canadian TV show. Like, You're such a trendsetter. I was such a trendsetter for like I'm a four-year-old. <laughs> So ahead of my time. I know. And I remember like going to my parents and saying like, I made up this phrase and now I, it's everywhere. My dad was just like, you didn't make that up. And I'm like, oh, <laughs> huh. Fine then. Darn. Thought I was a genius. Well, so we talked a little bit about Hector who doesn't use paper to try to explain anything, but there's still some kind of hard concepts to go through here. And you mostly have them told from the point of view of a little girl, which I just adored, except for when you're like, walk like a boy. Then she's not. Is that a girl? Walk like a boy. Can you walk more like a boy? Don't do it with your arms. <laughs> Less <laughs> skipping. Walk. I, I loved all that. But did you have a hard time trying to put that through a child's point of view? Oh yes, it was. It was really rough. Um, actually, let's say this right now. Are we doing spoilers? Are we? Uh, as, as many I mean, as you want. I mean, I I don't want to say what was happening, but just that she's okay. one of the people who's one of your POV characters, yeah. and yeah. she's so, I think she's your Jordy LaForge. She gets taxed with most. Yeah. Of <laughs> Let's explain all the hard concepts. Also, you're a child. Have fun with that. Also, English <laughs> yeah. is not your English language. is not your second language. <laughs> I mean, and... Be more precise. <laughs> that was honestly it. It was funny because it became a the the double edged sword that because she is a child and that English is her second language. I sort of got a lot of leeway that if she didn't understand that, and I thought this actually becomes at some points more creepy when she's explaining things as a little yes. kid would explain them. Yes. Um, but at the same time, then I was struggling because I, I, as you may have noticed, I am an almost middle-aged white man. And I was like, <gasps> no, for those of you who are just, for those of you just listening in. Um, yeah. Peter uh, is a white guy. I think people like when they heard <laughs> from a seaside town in Maine, it might have been yeah. a little. It was obvious. probably enough. Yeah, <laughs> pasty white from Innsmouth. <laughs> <laughs> but um, yeah. So it's like I, I obviously have never been a a twelve year old girl with PTSD, and it became this careful thing that I was like, ah, oh, I was constantly checking with like, with my partner, with other women I know, and like, okay, would this make sense? Would this make sense? And then trying to filter that back through the language issues and, you know, her view of the world in general. Um, so in one way, it was very freeing. My first draft, I 
flew through Natalie's section of the book. Like it was great. And it was actually much bigger originally. Um, originally Natalie, we, we, she tells her entire story. Oh, okay. Until, yeah. Yeah. All, without again, giving too much away with the part where Hector's like, okay, can we skip it? Just skip it. Yeah. Stop I, talking. I, I told every bit of it. Um, and my agent saw that and he was like, was you your agent kind of the voice of Hector saying, can you just skip around? Can you just a little bit, highlights? yeah. It's the a important part, Peter. <laughs> and he was like, he's like, this is good. He's like, don't get me wrong, it's really good and I like it, but it, it goes on for a while. <laughs> and I'm like, yeah, but it's important. And he's like, could it be important faster? <laughs> be important <laughs> faster? Sure. But, which, which yeah, I know makes it, it sound awful. I love my agent. I have a great agent. And he, he knows what he's talking about when he does this. And I know the book is much stronger that, that he and I sat down and pulled some stuff apart, added some new stuff in. Um, and I'm, I'm actually very, very happy with how it is. But yeah, first draft, writing Natalie was so great. And then second draft was just where I started panicking over everything. I was like, <laughs> yeah. okay. okay. You know, and I'm, I was asking my partner I would, the most bizarre questions about like, you know, okay, when you're growing up as a little girl, when do you notice this? When does this happen? When would okay, this and I, I know what you're you're in you're you're yeah, referencing as far as there is another character who's slightly older than that character who is uh you know her her responses to things are a little different. She's a side character, so I can see how that yeah. would have been relevant. You weren't just and, and searching for weird topics. I know. Like at what age so, does this happen? And people are like, "Don't be gross, Peter." Yeah, Peter. But kind of a pervert. Like, <laughs> <laughs> Peter the pervert. No, it's for a book. It's for a book. It's right? for a book <laughs> Always my excuse, but we only get away with it for so long. <laughs> yeah. Well, and these are things that it's best that you didn't just Google as mm. a middle-aged white man being like, "When yeah. does a little girl know?" That would that would unquestionably come back to haunt me at some point. Yeah. So. But it was always, I thought, very much so handled so delicately. And I feel like some of the things you did, especially earlier on in Natalie's journey, because they're through her perspective and her not really understanding what was happening, you can be really harsh and blunt with the realistic the realistic aspects of the story she's going through. Because for those who haven't gotten a chance to read it, because it only came out yesterday, this story deals with some mis mishandling of things. Let's just... Let's call it that by the yeah, government. Yeah, would say maybe so. mishandling of things that happen on or near our borders. Yeah, on or near our our borders, and how to the children people who might come through there are treated and things like that. And and the way she's able to talk about it without like just going through it, as opposed to it coming across as political or judgmental. She's just experiencing it. So there's a yeah, real she's just saying like, the words. Yes, it's and like. That it's on the surface right there. Like this is where she is. This is what she has to eat. This is where she sleeps. And that was another, another tricky thing because again, I, I am not arrogant enough. I am, I am definitely not the guy who'd be talking about the, this is what it is like to be someone trying to immigrate, seek asylum, come to America um, from a South American country. That is not my story to tell. So I, I, wanted to use it when I when I was search, planning out the book and I realized this fits, but I also didn't want it to be the, the double thing. I don't want to be like you're saying, punching home commentary on this. Right. Yeah. Right. That it or was just like, like exploitative or like intentionally inflammatory. Like, hey, people are upset about this. Let's make a whole story about it where it's like exactly oh, this is just the narrative and, device that made sense to get Natalie where yeah. she needed to be for the story. Exactly. Yeah. And it, it sort of comes back to what we were saying before about your childhood. When you're a kid, everything seems normal. Right. So to Natalie, she wasn't making a statement about what was happening to her because she right. was a child. It's and that what was, was what, normal. Right. And that's what I wanted to be was she she just doesn't have the world experience to know is this <laughs> like she knows this isn't right, but perhaps doesn't realize how wrong some of this is. Yeah. And again because she is just sort of stating facts and leaving a lot of it for you to fill in mm -hmm. of oh this is probably that oh she's talking yeah. about this yes that so okay. some of um the most emotional parts for me with natalie were simply when she would just say things like i don't understand what that means just those words like because you could you know when hector's asking her a question what he's actually asking her and that's when it hits home again that she's a kid 
Yeah. yeah it's, she's going through so much, but again, you still have this real vulnerable child that then brings out this vulnerability in Hector and his desire to protect her and figuring out how to do that, especially when things start going really, really weird and disgusting. <laughs> and disgusting, <laughs> Peter. You have got to know. I think Jen and I both love this book, but the number of times we were texting each other, that was so gross. <laughs> and, then, uh, and then I realized, and Jen, I didn't, I I didn't tell you this earlier. You realize we have no room to complain. Our show is called Vox Vomitus. <laughs> I know. I thought to myself, this is the did. best <laughs> show for Peter. But our show <laughs> is Vox yeah. What what I'm hearing is this book <laughs> succeeds with you on many levels. Yes. Yeah, it really hit home <laughs> thematically. Gallons for... of level. <laughs> and I will say, because I, and I don't want to say exactly what it is, but this book gave me a brand new phobia. Oh, yeah. Well, <laughs> thank you. That I was like, right. I've never thought of that before. And now I've been thinking about it ever since. Pretty much. Pretty much. Every time I cough. I'm like, uh, as an it, asthmatic, I cough a lot. And I'm like, oh, we're not. We're not even worried it's COVID anymore. <laughs> I'm completely <laughs> worried that like something gross. from the broken room has happened to me. You're like, oh, <laughs> what did I just? And I think that that's just it. I haven't looked on Amazon to see where you have this posted as far as what genre. I, I keep saying you're a sci-fi thriller author. Is that is that what you term yourself I, as? Or what are you? I I'm just a white man again. We already know that one. <laughs> <laughs> like I'm you just a man card. from Maine. <laughs> No, I've, I've never really thought of it. I, I've joked with friends that like, you know, I my stuff tends to be too sci-fi to be classified as horror and it tends to be too horror to get classified as sci-fi. And with this one, I kind of spun off entirely differently. And, you know, it's kind of an action thriller. Oh, it's for a lot of definitely it. action-y. Um, and a couple books before this, I had a book, Paradox Bound, that is this kind of feel-good time travel story. That, that um, well, like, F, that's just actually was funny because I wrote Paradox Bound and uh, F. Paul Wilson, who writes the Repairman Jack books, um, asked if he could read it ahead of time. He and I know each other. So I was like, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, send it to him. And he got in touch with me. He's like, so this is like a sort of gentler, kinder Peter Kleins now. <laughs> and and that's kind of been hanging over me. And then when this book came out, oh, so I was like, like I'm when I was writing this book, I'm like, I got to send this one to Paul. <laughs> like who's so gentle and kind now <laughs> like if so i'd like to introduce you to the doll and patchwork man the end oh my gosh <laughs> those are just spoilers because those names out of context mean mean nothing they mean nothing no. i will just say i loved all of the side characters in these too. Two. i was just like oh my gosh i wanted a whole book about the doll can I we get quilt. a doll novella mm -hmm. a doll novella Please. Probably somewhere. Maybe. Yeah, even if you just give it directly to us. <laughs> oh. <laughs> you can't ask doesn't... for those, Jen. We're not allowed. <laughs> um, just give it to us. Like, your agent doesn't need to see it if you don't know. <laughs> <laughs> A little something, something. It's like, <laughs> oh, under there. Just let me slide into your DMs with this manuscript. <laughs> <laughs> like, I get a lot of gross DMs, but... <laughs> Yeah, and then after everything we've said, you know what it'll be full of is all the things we said. Ah, about uh, no! Oh my gosh, it's a whole book about there. that. <laughs> no. Okay, but so you're. Like, oh, sorry. So, no, I was just gonna say your first draft came out, and you loved it. It was working, and then the second draft was when you started to doubt yourself. How many drafts did this take? I am generally about a five draft person. Yeah. Uh, for me, which is that I will. When I do a, a first draft, it is just me sort of plowing through, and I'm very much the person who will. I skip over stuff a lot. Like I will lift, just leave big notes, you know, in brackets to myself. Like, mm -hmm. yeah, you know what I mean. That big Transition big note. Here. Insult. Yes. <laughs> I know what I'm doing. Make sure this is true. Yeah. yeah. Make, Make sure this is true. Is this possible? somehow he has to get the gun? Yeah. Make this cooler. <laughs> yeah make this um, make sense is something I, I i've written i have written books where like some of the nerds to myself is like this guy should have been dead three chapters ago make <laughs> remember that later <laughs> like that he should have been dead and you need to kill him off or that he should have I, been surviving I, this long i have i have actually done that i in one of my books dead moon uh the first draft i think i got up to like chapter 12 or 13 and i realized like this character should have died like back in chapter eight during this whole thing. 
Go and back so, from, and so from that point on, in the first he was draft, just invisible. He was dead. He was just dead. He had like from that point on, there was like the big note to myself, and he was chapter. So when I went back, like chapters eight through twelve, I had to sort of fill in now. Okay, he died back then. Now I need to write rewrite all of this. Get but, you out because you are dead. Yeah, that's just <laughs> it. My, so so my first my first drafts are super messy. Second drafts are when I start going through and okay. Now I actually need to connect all this stuff. I okay. I can't just say make this cooler. I actually have to figure out how does this become you actually cooler. Have to do it. Yeah, yeah. I, it and that's cool. when I start like sending random notes to friends about mm -hmm. like again when you have a good body of friends. You're like, so how exactly would you break into a modern car? What would you do? <laughs> how would you do and, it? <laughs> and luck, well, and luckily I have friends where it's like, okay, electronic locks, or would it be? <laughs> And, well, and you cover so much of those those kind of details in such an efficient way, and you've got this character who really seems to get those things and is always thinking about it. So it's not just it happens, but you're also giving the reader kind of the, the mental process of like, I'm picking that one, not that one. I'm going here, not there. So it's not just it happens and it's just kind of throwaway action, but it gets us inside his head, which I love because a lot of I action doesn't too. do that. Well, see, I, I like... I like bringing people in to have that rationale so you can see because I think it also makes people look smarter. And I think we like smart characters. I like, especially when they're smart, there are a couple points in this that we see Hector set stuff up. Yeah. That he will just he will just explain, okay, we're going to go in there and we're going to do this and this mm -hmm. and then you do this. And then and I then, said, I'm tired. And then the, <laughs> and then the whole thing, And then the whole thing plays out and you realize, oh my God, he like, like he just thrown out these casual things, do this, then do this. And you realize how much stuff he has just set up. Yeah. That this all played out exactly as you wanted. And I think we like that. It's this is like why a, he's my book boyfriend now. It, <laughs> it, it, it's someone pulling off tons of little mini heists, basically. It is. I love a good yeah. heist. So. And all of that totally worked, including like going, okay, I, watching him something as simple as dragging a backpack on the ground so it doesn't look new. Just those little tiny yeah. details are the kind yeah. of things that go, yeah, if I'm ever trying to evade everybody, I'm going to do that too. I have, I've taken notes now for next time I need to evade anybody pursuing me. I, I actually had in an earlier book, uh, I had a, a former NSA guy get in touch with me and ask <gasps> who my consultant was. And I was like, <laughs> I, and I was like, I just made it all up. And he was like, what? And I was like, yeah, I just, it all seemed logical to me to do stuff this way. So that's how I wrote it. Did they try to recruit like, you at that point? No, but he just, he smiled. He was like, you got a, a lot more stuff right than you probably know. <laughs> and it's like, well, good. Good? Like, please don't have this go on my permanent record anywhere where people I are have, now watching me. I have so much stuff my, on my permanent record, I'm sure. <laughs> And one of, the, one of the things that I did love when you covered things like having the fact that Natalie's point of view is someone who doesn't have formal education, meaning she's, she's spitting back things that she doesn't fully understand, either because of things that have been said to her or around her. My favorite, and I won't spoil what, which one it is, is when she repeats a name that isn't a name. Yes. <laughs> And like I know who that is. It's not even a who, but I, I love that kind of thing because I actually laughed out loud. And for a book that is very gross and very high in stakes and emotionally intense, it's also very funny in places. It and I, I love funny. I love that you just kind of hit all of those notes. And it's not like okay, well you're gonna have this and you're gonna be miserable reading. It's like no, this book is still it's just fun. Yes, it's it's fun. And so many other books like this that kind of go to those darker places. They stop being fun because you're just like, oh, this is going to end so bad. Oh, this is getting worse. Are we yeah, ever going to get out of this? I don't like where this yeah, is going. I, oh. I I don't like reading those books myself. So, and, and, I'm a, and I'm a big believer that obviously it's something really powerful if I can make you laugh and then horrify you like yep. a couple beats later. <laughs> yeah. to, Yes, you know, and that, it was just be... a couple beats later where I'm like, yes, <laughs> oh my god, no. <laughs> 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 um, <laughs> and uh, it really, it, the book reads like a movie. Yeah. So, 
Fingers crossed. Who knows? I know. I'm like, do you know anything? <laughs> well, we can't do dream casting yet because you know how flow some of these things work. By the time if we start casting Natalie, that kid would be, you know, forty. Like, honest, honest to God, true story. And I, and I make this. I, I mentioned this in the notes in the back. Um, I am not really big on fan casting generally. I don't think of anybody while I'm writing this. Um, when I just started writing this in like October 20, October 2019 was when I sat down and pounded out those two chapters. Like I said, the first two chapters. And I remember thinking, you know who'd be really good in this? That guy, Pedro Pascal from Game of Thrones. <laughs> not like, even doing his and, Mandalorian. He's And he's in that new Mandalorian show that comes out. So I wonder how he'd feel about doing like a lone wolf and cub thing about like a badass protecting a little kid. <laughs> and That's then like two Natalie weeks later, and two weeks later, <laughs> the Mandalorian comes out. <laughs> and I'm like, well, not getting Pedro Pascal for the movie, I guess. <laughs> You don't know. We don't know. Still want to, <laughs> we still want to do it, but I mean, just so long as there's enough of a difference between a little baby green alien who likes to eat fish eggs. I mean, honestly, we just came back to the gross things in the mouth again. I'm, <laughs> I'm like, I'm not sure it's all that yeah. different, honestly. <laughs> I just went, I didn't even go. There. It's just no. becoming more and more of the same thing. It's... Yeah, don't, don't. don't mm. We're never going to get it. <laughs> We're never going to get out of this. So I think I read in the afterword to your book that you said, you know, you wrote this book and then did you say something like it wasn't the book that your agent or your publisher was it expecting? Is, it, it was not. Like you were supposed um, to be writing something else? <laughs> yes, I was. I I have actually been working on a time travel book. And it was this whole thing that I had. I'd had this idea for a time travel book and I won't go into it too much, but I really liked it. And it was very much more of a small stake sort of thing. And I showed it to my agent and he was like, mm, it just doesn't feel like it's big enough. Like, it just feels too small. And I'm like, all right. And then I played with it some more and I outlined it again. And then I actually got to sit down with uh, one of my editors from, or with my editor from Random House. And he and I talked about it. And he's like, it just feels like it's missing something. He's like, you're usually really good about, like, halfway through a book kind of flipping things over. And then having everyone go, oh, wait, this book's actually, this is what's going on. And he's like, and, and this doesn't have that. This doesn't feel like a Peter Klein's book. I'm like, all right, so I went back. And I, and I had, like, rewritten my outline for this thing three or four times. And I was just, uh, you know, starting to lose interest in it, to be terribly honest. Um, and I'm, I'm still probably going to go back to it at some point. But then I got inspired with this. And I hit it and I wrote it. And I told me, I was like, all right, I'm working on something. And I, you know, it's been about a year going into 2020, which was a sucky year to try and write. Which was just like the perfect time to be writing anything. Everybody the was broken, so relaxed. And, uh, the broken just, year. The broken year. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And and then I sent it to him, I think like in August of last year. I was like, all right, it's all done. And he got it. And I told him like, you know, it's this new thing with a new title. Blah, blah, blah. And he had just sort of thought that I had rewritten the whole thing. So he, uh, got, no, like, different so he was like waiting for the time travel to start. Yeah, he sort of got four chapters into it. And I got this email from him. It's like, this isn't the time travel book. And I was like, no, no, it's not. No, it's and not. he's like, and there was like this long pause. And then he's like, are you working on the time travel book? Like, no, not right now. And he's like, okay. And, and he read it. And he's like, yeah, I like this. And then he got back to me and he was like, and like we said, he's like, all right, you know, let's shorten that. Let's change this a little bit. Do this. And and he had some good, solid notes. So I went back and rewrote part of it. And he took it out. And we got some interest. And then we got other interest. And we made some deals. And now it's in everyone's hands. So, Well, you know, supply chain. We so we have it. We That's have what it. matters. That's what we have matters. it. What's, what's funny is Allison got it, I think, like two days before I did and I was like what I didn't get mine oh she my was gosh. So mad. <laughs> I was so mad and then I realized I hadn't been to the mailbox because I live in rural New Hampshire and the mailbox is way at the end of my very long driveway <laughs> so I was like oh it's cold it's and I was like, so I sent my husband. I'm like, can you go to the mailbox? I might have something. And he came back <laughs> and there it was. So I immediately took a picture of it and sent it to Allison. I'm like, oh, it was in my it mailbox. <laughs> like, Sorry, I down. out. <laughs> <laughs> I'm like, the book looks so pretty. I can't believe I didn't get one. Sorry. Yeah. I was hysterical. It is a very pretty book. It's it very is. pretty. And it's big and it's 
heavy. It's it's heavy, and as anybody saw my Instagram yesterday, I unintentionally matched it with my shirt. I mean, my kid take a picture of me holding it. I'm like, I match my book. I I don't know why, but I make her do things like that. Look at I tried to match the book today, but I think I'm I'm. You're close. You're I'm close. close. In real life, this looks closer to that. Like it, it works. It's all good. You know, priorities. Okay, so are you are you gonna go back? You said possibly to do maybe a fifth draft of that time travel book. Is it? Is it the kinder, gentler Peter Klein's? Do we need it to be um, less kind and gentler? No, um, no, it's not. But I actually, the, the the thing is though, then my agent and I started talking, and I've, I'm currently about sixty thousand words into a a completely different book uh, again. <laughs> but this one he knew about, and this is actually one of those things. I, I, you know, every now and then he and I will get together, and I will just bounce ideas off him, and he's like, "Oh, that sounds cool." I'm like, "Yeah, I don't really want to do it though not right now." <laughs> and and then he's like, "Oh." Well, <laughs> this is so why you can only well, tell your agent about ideas that you really already have in your but, head. You and have not really learned that lesson either, Jen. I have not learned that. Lesson. <laughs> oh, I guess I'll write that book then. <laughs> That's just it. I have, a, like I said, I have a great agent, and he and he yeah. he respects my bizarre process. So, um, but yeah, I actually have two things kind of back to back that we're going to try and do that are not related in any way to each other, but they're fun and weird and twisted and uh those are all the words i like yeah and the, like the one the one i'm working on right now has also has time travel but it's a different time travel book <laughs> and also has aliens and dinosaurs and weird space anomalies and a bunch of other cool stuff Ooh. um and then the one after that i'm still fleshing out little bits of it i who is the the new cop in a small town in maine um and basically it's like a little resort town and what he comes to find out more or less i didn't hear you i didn't hear you oh, sorry. Um, uh, sorry basically uh he he moves into a little small town mm -hmm. uh as the new cop and what he comes to find out is they are the little town they are the little town across the lake from Camp Crystal Lake. <gasps> oh and, my God. <laughs> that and, means something to you, Jen, it doesn't to me. Should it, I know what Camp Crystal Lake is? It's Well, obviously it's not Camp Crystal Lake for copyright reasons and all. Yeah, yeah I was gonna say, but what are you idea. calling it? <laughs> um, I'm probably calling it like, you know, like Camp New Eden or something silly, something like that. Um, Allison, Camp Crystal Lake is a long time summer camp where kids are go to learn arts and crafts and boating and get decapitated. Then get decapitated. And then they get <laughs> they're very bad for all of those things. Yes. Their head counselor, their head counselor is brutal. <laughs> I love it. I, I just know I just want to just dream cast the name of this place in Camp New Eden. I'm I, I'm still playing I mean it's super rough. I'm playing around with everything, but that's gonna the way I, I pitched it to him was uh, are you familiar with uh, Edward Cantero had Meddling Kids? No. His book. Oh, it's it's a really wonderful book. It's not Scooby Doo grown up, but it's also it's Scooby Doo grown up. As soon as you said absolutely. those Meddling Kids, that's where we yeah. all went. I yeah. pulled um, my mask off, and I would have gotten yeah. away with it too. Yeah, it, <laughs> oh, you should definitely check it out because basically it's about the the mystery gang, but not Meddling Kids yeah. or not, not Scooby Doo. <laughs> Uh, getting back There's together no again is a dog that talks. No, there is not. Oh, but there is okay. a dog. Um, <laughs> there is a dog. Yes, there is a dog, dog who is who's like the grandson of their dog they had as kids. Oh, uh, that's funny. Yes, uh, <laughs> you just broke Jen. <laughs> I know. Yes. and the whole idea is that they're coming back together because they're realizing, like, yes, when we were kids, we solved all these mysteries. We solved the mystery at the old summer camp and the mystery at the old house, the mystery old, and, and they're coming to realize, wait, what? what actually happened that last night on our last case at the old house? And it spins into this crazy Lovecraftian mystery that they are coming back to solve as adults now. That reminds me kind of of one of Straub's books. Jenna, you remember, do you remember which one I'm talking about? I'm trying to think of the one, the one with Lee and Eel, but I'm not remembering the title. I can't remember. 
it's not ghost story i'll think of it later it's not ghost story but it's one where it's it's kids who then grow up later and then you know something terrible happened and one of them died and then that's like one of my favorite genres of any kind of book or movie is yes something terrible happens when people are kids Mm -hmm. and then they have to come back and do anything i'll read anything that that's about well and coco straub has that too they're not kids but they're young young uh young military guys who come back and say, and one of your old Marine buddies or military buddies is probably killing a lot of people right now. We should probably go yeah. stop him. It's probably our fault. Love it. But not the camp kids. Camp kids are never at fault. They're innocent. I know. They're innocent. They're just making macrame. Have you seen Jason X? Jason X is, honest to God, my favorite Friday the 13th movie. No, I have. And the, it, it is the infamous Jason in space. <laughs> I know. But it, that's why I was like, that's the way it is. Piece in I space. <laughs> love it. I honestly love it. And I think it is magnificent. But there's a bit where basically Jason gets stuck on a holodeck. And they describe <laughs> that the way we will contain him is they recreate Camp Crystal Lake. But on and a so, holodeck. But on a holodeck. And you have this, like, you know, massive cybernetic Jason stomping around. <laughs> and there are these two nubile teenage girls who, like, wave more. It's like, hi, would you like to smoke some pot? Sex? We love premarital sex. <laughs> He's like, oh, those are the first girls to die. <laughs> he goes to stab, and they're just, you know, hard light. This isn't really doing it's, anything. It is. It is. It's such a funny scene. I love. Now it. I want to see just that scene, if not the whole movie. I'm oh, like, just I'm gonna get to YouTube after this. And yeah, watch you will, just that you will scene. find it, and it is the Plus, whole. I love awesome. it. I think it's a, a great movie, and I've I have like other friends who are horror fans, and I will stand by. My firm conviction that Jason X is one of the best friends of the thirteenth. Okay, so you're so you the book you're working on that has dinosaurs and space people is Jason in space in your book too? <laughs> no. no, no, that's actually that is actually based off uh in, in the same way meddling kids is not uh not Scooby Doo. Um, it is not Scooby Doo in any way. Uh, this story, basically the one I'm working on with aliens and dinosaurs and time travel, uh, is about this guy that when he was a kid he and his dad and his sister were on a whitewater rafting trip and fell through a hole in space and time <laughs> into this valley where there are dinosaurs. Marshall, oh. Bill, and Holly. And oh. two years later, oh. the last. <laughs> and then two years later, he got thrown out oh. and has so spent the rest of his life trying. We've seen that. <laughs> well, yes. But for, in this, the, this guy for the rest of his life has been trying to get back to rescue his sister. Oh. And so the whole book is about a trying to go back to things you remember as a kid and finding out yeah. what were they really like. Yeah. Kind, of, kind of like how we started talking. That yep, like it's all you, coming full circle. Exactly, like we planned it. This like way. we planned this interview. <laughs> this show is not scripted, guys. This takes a lot of work <laughs> and just coordination. We're just like this. Synced up Sorry. our brains. Sorry, now my we brain are is one. Currently, still wanted to be a sleeve stack. <laughs> <laughs> I'm so scared of the sleep stacks. Don't. Don't Everybody. make some noise. But my oh sister my would be like, oh, they're off the screen now, Allison. And I'd be like, doing this. <laughs> she did the opening of the Muppet show because she knew I was scared of that too. My sister's mean to me. I hope she's watching right now. <laughs> you were scared of the Muppet show? I Well, okay, I was. I, I am. <laughs> but the opening credits, so they come out in different groups. The little ones, the bigger ones. The bigger ones scared me because, you know, those are the ones that ate the guests whole. Like they did when they were <laughs> in the Copacabana. Like she goes on. She didn't walked. know you were scared of Muppets. You never told me when I told you my first love was Sam the Eagle. Well, but here's the thing. I'm not scared of Sam the Eagle because Sam the Eagle is about this size. All the hand and rod ones are fine. It's the full body puppets that can eat people. So what yes. we'd be watching it and I would close my eyes when they'd be walking out. And she was supposed to tell me when they were off. Now I was too dumb to realize they always go off at the same point in the music. So if I would have just listened, I would have been fine. But no, I'd be still like, hey, tell me when it's over. Tell me when it's over. She'd be like, it's over. And I'd be like, ah! and then running off again, because this is what big sisters do to their little sisters. And you tell me all the time that I remind you of your sister. But I love you. <laughs> and that's the difference. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but I love my sister too, but you weren't around me when I was little to be able to do that. And considering how much you would have been probably really enjoying that. Also, I'm older than you, Jen. You couldn't have done it because I was older than you. <laughs> You can't. On that note, poor Peter's like, what did I just get involved in? No, this is great. I'm actually loving it. <laughs> I was I was totally confused. And when you mentioned, oh my God, I forgot that's right. Muppets ate people sometimes. They did. Do you not? There's the one where they're all doing, I get by with a little help from my friends. And they're carrying somebody to go be sacrificed to like some 
Incan or Aztec altar god. Of course, there were Muslim, maybe but... some drugs going on in that writing it, room. Like, Do not so much be merged in Henson's name, Jennifer. Yeah. <laughs> so much of that stuff like worked on different levels, and I think every now and then when we were kids, we would we would glimpse that other level and yeah. suddenly kick in like, wait, what's going on here? <laughs> I think I was always on that other level, which is why I got terrified. <laughs> <laughs> like I showed my kids the Muppaphone recently. Have you seen the Muppaphone? Where they're whacking oh, the thing so. on the head and they go, oh, yes. Oh, my God. I forgot. That's about... the instruments. And Sir Wences has a head in the box. I'm sorry. All of this stuff is terrifying. I, also I was really scared figure. of that episode of the Muppets when they had that, oh, my gosh, that Swedish puppet troupe with the clay faces. And they... Who are the, they're called Moomin Chance. Chance. It was Moomin yes. Chance. Moomin yeah. Chance, Moomin Chance was, is always scared. He's always scared. Yeah. yeah, very scared of the Moomin Chance mm -hmm. when I was small. Even now, still, like, if I'm like, oh, I'm the Moomin mm -hmm. Chance. And I'm scared of the bread and puppet puppets that run around <laughs> and do political, political protest stuff with, you know, LBJ. And now we're singing hair. I won't sing anymore, I promise. <laughs> so now, now Peter knows way too much about our childhood <laughs> fears and uh, way well, too I, much I, about I, us in general. I, I, Gave you all mine right up front. So this is why our show is basically fake Latin for word vomit. Because mm -hmm. <laughs> sure, we talk about the writing process being word vomit, but eventually the interview always it's, it's, goes off, off, off kilter. And Peter, you're you're busy tonight because you've got a signing. Can you I you want to for people who are watching live who might want to be like, well, now that I've read this, read, yeah. seen this, I need to go get the book. Where can if, they find you? If you're you? watching live uh, tonight, I'm going to be, and you're in Southern California. Uh, tonight, yes. I'm going to be at Mysterious Galaxy. Uh, in San Diego, um, talking about the book, telling more stories about writing it, how it came to be. Um, and then I'm also going to be actually this weekend, I'm going to be up in Los Angeles at Dark Delicacies. So, Allison, go see him. I'd rather, I'd rather go down to San Diego because it's a better drive than going to LA, but I gotta get my kids. Yeah. <laughs> Can you send my kids? Yeah. Bring them along. <laughs> <This one. laughs> Peter, thank you so much for thank being you. here. You've been amazing. Everybody who's watching this live, watching this on the replay, buy The Broken Room. If you are watching this on the replay on YouTube, make sure to hit like and subscribe on our YouTube station. This is your place to find all the episodes of Vox Vomitus, as well as To the Moon, Allison, and Let's Scare Jennifer to Death. Stay tuned next week for our episode of Vox Vomitus with Robert Gwaltney with his book, The Cicada Tree. Bye. Bye.